rise for the pledge, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. session October 21st we were a little delayed on our start and hoping that the uh, village attorney would get here if he's going to run a little bit late but uh, we're going to go ahead and start the meeting and there might be one issue on here we're going to want uh, and so uh, we've got uh, public comment uh, we have uh, so a couple of people have signed up Ellen Conrad I'm here to exercise my First Amendment rights to petition my government for a redress of uh, grievances, one for each, okay? I, Evelyn Conrad, am presenting this petition for redress of grievances to the Board of Trustees of the Incorporated Village of Southampton as a registered voter in the Incorporated Village of Southampton, as a bona fide owner of property, 18 South Roscoe Drive in the Roscoe Place subdivision since 1984, and is a registered attorney with a land use and zoning practice. This petition asks the Board of Trustees for the following remedial actions, and incidentally, I've given you enough uh, uh, documentation for you to implement the first two tonight. Remedial actions to avoid the appearance of complicity by the trustees with the ARB in its multiple violations of residents' constitutional rights and ownership rights in the Roscoe Place subdivision. One, an immediate nullification of the 14 October ARB grant for the 96 Leo's Lane application. 96 Leo's Lane is an address that does not exist legally in the Roscoe Place subdivision. You have the backup documents in front of you. Furthermore, the mailing list provided by the building department for that application shows violations of constitutional rights of owners in an approved and certified subdivision. Two, an immediate stay on all applications for alterations and or construction in the Roscoe Place subdivision until this Board of Trustees can vote the same kind of six months moratorium on all such applications in the Roscoe Place subdivision, which it granted to the owners in the uh, estate section, who, unlike this petition for redress, did not claim frauds and violations of owner constitutional rights. Three, Referring the properties highlighted in the maps appended to this petition to the Planning Board of the Incorporated Village of Southampton for investigation of the illegalities surrounding both their applications to the ARB, their building permits, and certificates of occupancy from the building department. Four. A resolution to appoint independent counsel to the Board of Trustees to help the trustees in their supervisory and fiduciary responsibility of helping the Planning Board in its work. For purposes of legitimacy and impartiality, such counsel cannot, one, now represent or have represented any member of this government. Two, it cannot be a village attorney, uh, Richard Dupetris, who has owned a property on Johnny Lane in the Roscoe Place subdivision since 1972. And obviously not Albert W. Robinson, Jr., who has urged the illegalities on the members of the ARB. Three, no lawyer who represents or has represented applicants to the ARB or the ZBA. Five, neither the requested investigation by the planning board nor the redress is to be automatically limited to those properties highlighted on the appended maps. Those are provided only as an indication of the magnitude of the investigation into fraud and illegalities that permeate the construction of new houses in the Roscoe Place subdivision authorized by the ARB and encouraged by Albert W. Robinson and tolerated by this board of trustees until now. I'll be happy to help the independent counsel, the trustees, and the planning board in the execution of their duties to fulfill the requirements of this petition for redress according to the First Amendment of the Constitution of the United States. In an earlier version, I was suggesting that you appoint Nancy McGann to search for an uh, uh, independent counsel. Uh, I would have great confidence, but obviously it's up to you, but you should appoint someone to begin that work. Uh, if you have any question about the fact that I did not ask anyone else to sign this petition, may I briefly tell you exactly why. 37 of us residents of Roscoe Place subdivision uh, uh, signed petitions against uh, the um, uh, spec builder who was putting up 37 Leo's Lane behind me. Of course, that did nothing. 
we were steamrolled. 35 petitioners uh, for Burnett Street fought against the uh, spec builder who was putting up a far too large house there. They were steamrolled. That spec builder, by the way, knowing that she had a letter into the ARB and the building department that it was asbestos tile on that building, did no asbestos at abatement, spewed asbestos all over the, in the neighborhood. You can imagine, I'm concerned because houses in my area were also built in the 50s and 60s, an area, a time which was known for uh, asbestos tile, asbestos insulation, etc. 47 residents signed, um, asked the ZBA not to give a pass to the spec builder who violated the pyramid law. Obviously not permitted. <laughs> the ZBA, uh, that was under the guidance of Rick DePetris, the ZBA gave uh, the permission to uh, keep that uh, violation of the pyramid law, and the neighbor is continuously, of course, caught by that. Last, but certainly not least, 233 residents of this village, and there are some of us who remember this well, signed a petition uh, against uh, Paul Robinson subdividing two properties, one of them on the corner of uh, Little Plains. 233 residents' signatures were ignored, steamrolled by the ZBA, and I believe that uh, 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 subdivision is now before the planning board. So you can be very busy just checking on these things, but I am sticking to the Roscoe Place uh, subdivision. I'm merely trying to tell you why I didn't ask anyone else. Furthermore, I wouldn't subject anyone else to the kind of stuff I've gone through, the uh, flooding the basement, the sending a check from the insurer, the village insurer, to me, calling me claimant, municipal uh, officer. That was done on the 5th of August of last year. I received that, yeah. Uh, if you prefer, I'll go on afterwards in the second session. It's a good enough story. Right. Thank you so much for your time. Mr. Bachman. Uh, Bruce Bachman, 660 Halsey Neck Lane, here in the village. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you all for your support of the issues of the flood zones and getting the moratorium through. I think it's a wonderful opportunity for us to properly, at a proper pace, study the whole issue. And, and I thank you very much for sticking with us on that. I really do. But I'd like to discuss for a moment the uh, proposal by Nelson Pope and Voorhees. Um, I received a copy of it today. And uh, I've noticed that the consultant has proposed a series of interviews with village representatives, including village attorney, the architecture review board, and the planning commission to, quote, identify intent of what the village wants to encourage, discourage. And these interviews will be conducted during an information gathering early stage of, of their work. <coughs> But at no time is it proposed that other stakeholders really have an opportunity to provide their views as to what should be encouraged or discouraged until the very next last stage called preliminary findings and recommendations. And then, even then it states, quote, determine if other stakeholders should be consulted. <laughs> You know, if we look back to the history of how we got to the point of making this study, we should note that uh, no acknowledgement of the FEMA height issues came out of any of those parties that are going to be interviewed until after other stakeholders brought the issue up before you and you took it on immediately. <laughs> and I'd hate to have the village representatives be the only ones speaking on this issue. Uh, I think, I would, and I would advise it strongly, that you amend the proposal or do whatever is necessary to require the consultants to interview other stakeholders, which I mean residents, <laughs> taxpayers, um, neighbors, possibly architects, at an early stage to get a complete perspective of what the village wants and to incorporate that complete perspective into their thinking. Oh, we all know that things get locked in early. And if you get only one perspective at the beginning, it tends to carry its way through and then it's hell to break it out. So I would request that you take a look at that and try and get a broader group uh, trying to develop and deliver what the village wants. <laughs> I've got a second thought and uh, uh, much simpler. You know, having been through this whole process for the last <coughs> six months, and admittedly I'm, that doesn't make me an expert, but I think that what we see is we, that the, arch the uh, zoning rules are taken by the architects and then they try and design a house that provides as much square footage as possible within those rules. <coughs> and 
they don't always take into consideration the beauty or the neighborhood ambience because really square footage is how they make their money. I've hired them. I know the, pro know the issue. And I suggest that when the uh, consultants come up with their recommendation, that we test it in the marketplace before you actually accept it. We should hire maybe three architectural firms, give them the new rules, and say, build us the biggest house you can build, and let's see what we get. You know, we may get what John Bennett has referred to as the West Hampton style uh, matchbook on stilts, or we may not. We might get something really beautiful out of it and find out that our rules, you know, have real application. So that's just a suggestion, but I wanted, while I was here, to uh, toss it into the hopper. Well, the, 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 you know, a lot of this, uh, the interviews and all of this stuff is going to be done at the Planning Commission all in public oh, I understand form. that. And that's, uh, and I think that when I talked to Chick Voorhees, that was the whole purpose of we we're going to do the same way we did with when we did residential zoning uh, changes, uh, use that Planning Commission in that format right there as the format for people to come in and speak right. about and stuff. So. Uh, that's I just suggest that what they put yeah. down no, it's, made it's it important. look like it was yeah. totally internally again. Oh, you're and not the only really person. You, you're not out. the only person to say that about the no. proposal, and, uh, and I know that, that Paul Travis and I have spoken about it, and then the whole thing is driven right around the planning commission and the right. meetings in the public format behind that. So uh, it'll be extremely important for all of us to get in and, and get people. I think so. That point well, good. Thank you. That's all right. Thanks. One side. Anyone else from the public would like to uh, speak? Okay, so we'll close this uh, public comment. We've got uh, some board presentations. Gary? Good evening. Gary Galeski, Superintendent of Public Works, Southampton Village. Um, earlier today, I asked Steve to uh, send you copies of the plan of the Agawam Boardwalk that we've been talking about for many years now. Uh, I do have two larger versions on the table if anybody else would like to see it. Uh, we've been talking about this, I guess, about six years now. Yeah. Uh, got a little bit closer this year uh, by installing the, the dock and the, uh, the floating dock and ramp for the new Agawam Ferry as a phase one of this project. Uh, recently, uh, we've completed design of an Agawam boardwalk, and as this week, we just finished up a bid book. Uh, from Nelson and Pope that they've written and we are now ready to go out to bid for the project. Uh, the project is basically a 12 foot wide decking along the north end of Lake Agawam in between the lake and the monument. Uh, we're looking at a tropical hardwood finish uh, for it. Uh, we will not be allowed to treat this wood at all so we need something that's going to be lasting for a long time. And this is the recommended wood to use. Uh, it would be two uh, sets of pilings, uh, two rows of pilings, excuse me, one along the water's edge and one going into the ground about 12 feet back <coughs> uh, would allow us to put this boardwalk attached to the ferry ramp across the north end and then leading over to the playground where we could attach and have an ADA uh, compatible walkway with, that would then connect Pond Lane uh, to O'Connell Drive parking lot. Uh, the main reason for this in, in my mind is just to beautify that end of the park uh, to actually allow us to use this waterfront. Um, I've seen many other communities who have waterfront to enjoy. The village really doesn't have that unless you want to go to the beach. Mm -hmm. So I envision this boardwalk going in with some street lighting, some benches, flowers, what have you, and just a nice soft area for people in the park who want to oversee the lake. Yeah. Uh, yes. Um, what kind of fencing will be on the water side for <coughs> people? I'm, I just am a little concerned about young children possibly falling in. The, the existing fencing that still remains uh, to the west of the ferry, we didn't address at this time. And that's an old chain link uh, galvanized fencing. When we get to the area of the new, uh, the railing along will be, um, will be a stainless steel cable that will go across. So basically you will see pilings, at, uh, you know, every 10 feet or so, stainless steel cables, about six of them across okay. with a top rail of a three by eight material. Uh, not sure yet if that would be IPE or green heart. Um, so essentially if you were looking out at the water, you would just see the top rail. You would see nothing else blocking your view of the lake. Um, 
Six cables should be enough. Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. spaced wise. Uh, if you look on your diagram, I, can, I could be off by the number, but I believe that's what it was. Mm -hmm. And those cables, we would just have a you know a little tensioning rod on the the beginning and the end, so we'd get them nice and tight. Stainless steel, we're hoping, will last us there uh, for many years. Seven, it looks like that. So I, I come to you tonight. I, I'd like to go out to bid for this project. Um, if you would be agreeable to it, I can get an ad in the Salmon Press on Monday, to come out on Thursday, and then I could start picking dates about handing out bid books and picking up bid books. Yeah. I think it's yeah. you, your presentation is great, Gary, because of tropical hardwoods, there's a lot of materials they use in decking today, but the trouble is a lot of them retain heat. And if you got people wandering around with bare feet, it gets gets a little uh, hot. But that those tropical wood decks are, are really nice. They don't, you know, and they they last pretty long. Yeah, uh, that's a big factor right there. We don't want any checking. Yeah, we don't want that wood splitting on us. And yeah, you know, it was a good choice. It's a good thing he's on here because I don't know the difference between a uh, tropical hardwood and uh, yeah. so. Well, it comes with a pirate. <laughs> yeah, that's right. A pirate's going on. Pirate. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm very excited about this project. This is going to beautify that whole area. I mean, just by cleaning up the trees and even improving the the dockage down there, did a great job. So mm -hmm. this is going to be fan. This is going to be fantastic. It really is. Yeah. Beautifying this. So. So we need a uh, motion to, I'll make a motion to authorize uh, Department of Public <coughs> Works to go out to bid uh, in accordance with the bid document for the uh, uh, Agawam Boardwalk. Second. 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 All in favor? Aye. 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 Could I ask Gary another question? <coughs> yeah. Okay. I called Gary today because I don't know if you want to talk about it or the chief wants to talk about it. Along North Main Street, we have all these signs that are covered with black plastic. <coughs> and a lot of people are like, what are these signs? Me included. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I have one friend who just could not stand it because it was in front of her house, so she had to go and unwrap it. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe you might want to tell the public what those signs are all about. Well, on Monday, I returned from lunch, uh, and I came down North Main, and I saw the signs. And I was like, I thought they were pretty I was odd. There were historic markers all over the no, village. No, so I, I just ripped the bag off myself, and the message says that basically the railroad is uh, going to renovate the North Main train trestle between October 28th and 30th. Uh, they want to replace some metal, so there'll be welding involved. They're estimating about 30 hours of work for the project, um, but that might be over two days. They will need to close the roadway, and you've also in that area you see. The, the time and date, but as you go further along, you'll see detour signs. Uh, <clears throat> a little put off because I didn't get any notification from the railroad, but I spoke to the railroad today uh, who promised me they're going to give me the whole plan and clue me in on the next time. What would you say, 20, 28th to the 31st? 28th or? through the, to the 30th. So no one, either through vehicle traffic or walking pedestrian, will be able to go pass through there? Correct. So that whole road is shut off? Correct. Uh, you know, so everybody has to go around... Well, that, that is their window. I, I couldn't tell you actual times. They're telling me about 30 hours of work. So, It's just the bridge by the railroad station. Um, I'd say that bridge takes more than 30 It's hours. not the one on North Sea Road. Correct, just, okay. just that one bridge. The thing is that's Halloween. Yeah. Uh, I don't know too much detail other than they said that they had to replace a lot of metal. Puts a little so it would be welding involved, and they have to shut the area down. It's funny because I was place, place I was driving by it the other day and I was thinking, God, they haven't worked on this in a long time because all the paint and everything is bubbling off and it's so rusty looking. It's about Probably six looked, years. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, they do periodically do it, and it's you know, you're back and forth. You don't want to stop them because they're doing good work to get right. it done, but we just like a little heads up next time. How far <laughs> north of the railroad tracks are they going to block off North Sea Road? Well, they're going to tour. Main they're, Street, really. they're going to take a detour uh, that they'll be using um, Willow Street, and then they'll do another detour uh, uh, next to the John Ducks area there on Prospect. Prospect. Mm -hmm. yeah, it would have been nice if we had uh, some kind of notification. So, but uh, I think I'll call Tom Neely see if he knew anything about they it. They didn't do it in July and August. <laughs> yeah. 
No, and if they get it done before the uh, the Halloween holiday, we, we should be fine. Well, yeah. that's the question because. Well, they say they will. They need to get their service up and running too, so I, I don't think they're going to delay. It doesn't interfere with the bus route for the kids because <coughs> they can't get buses underneath that trestle, can they? We'll have to detour. Uh, you know, honestly, yeah. Yeah. Going to there. someday yeah. they do. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, it's, it's so that's, bus, oh, that's right too. Think about that. Yeah, so bus is all going to be. Yeah, that's going to be a little. So we need to make sure that the schools and uh, hopefully they notified the schools. I don't think they notified anybody. That's why I'm going to wait for the contact this week and find out, and I'll, I'll call PD up because we have to know ambulance and fire right, as well. Right. Right. So. Okay. Okay. Yeah, because we need to make sure that OLH is notified, and they've got to notify all their parents and uh, and even mm -hmm. Southampton schools so that way they. Can reroute the buses. And stuff. Yeah, I'll yeah. follow up tomorrow, but I am okay. expecting contact. All right, good. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you Thanks, very much. Gary. Yep. Thanks, Gary. Thanks, Gary. Okay. Communications here. Okay. okay. First one is from Lung Cancer Research Foundation. On behalf of the Lung Cancer Research Foundation, I would like to request the date of Sunday, August 9th, 2015, for LCRF's 10th annual Strides for Life three mile fun run walk around Lake Agawam. As you know, this event circles Lake Agawa and begins and ends at the Cultural Center. In addition, the Foundation holds a children's 50-yard dash on the grass across from Veterans Hall. This event has special meaning for lung cancer patients and their families, as it was the first event of its kind in the country to raise funds for lung cancer research. We're looking forward to the 10th anniversary of Strides next year. In the first nine years, LCRF has raised over $5 million for lung cancer research. The Village of Southampton is to be congratulated for its pivotal role in helping to raise awareness and funding for lung cancer. Lung cancer remains the leading cause of cancer death in the U.S., and funding lags dramatically behind other cancers. We hope you will grant us permission once again to host a special event in Southampton. Dr. Gerard Sherman, Board of Directors. I can make a motion to authorize the uh, Lung Cancer Research Foundation uh, walk run <coughs> Sunday, August 9th, uh, 2015, in accordance with their letter dated September 23rd, 2014. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And next one is from Ellen Hermanson's. They're requesting to do their 20th annual Ellen's Run on Sunday, August 16th, 2015, uh, 9 to 11, 8,000 participants. Yeah. So um, I'd like to uh, make a motion to authorize the uh, Ellen's Run in accordance with the uh, letter dated uh, September 10th, 2014. Uh, for their 20th annual Allen, Allen's run on Sunday, August 16th, 2015. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. The route is not <coughs> confirmed yet. This is on here. Route not confirmed. Right. Yeah, they, they probably Will run they the come back to us on that or not? Mm -hmm. It's probably it's, the same. It'll be the you same. Think it will it be the same. same road. Okay. It, what they did. This year, because they, they modified the route just a little bit this year, um, and because uh, my fat butt was walking, running it, so <laughs> <laughs> so we'll have to drive it next. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Resolutions item one, resolve that the reading of the minutes for the public session of October 9th, 2014 be dispensed with and those minutes be accepted as filed by the village administrator and the actions taken at that meeting being hereby are ratified and approved. Have a motion? I'll make them. Yeah. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Resolve that the claims for the warrant stated October 21st, 2014, tolling 408,433.48, warrant seven general fund and 221,662.08. Warrant 5, Capital Reserve Fund, and the village payrolls from the period of October 3rd, 2014 to October 16th, 2014, being ordered and approved. Got a motion? Make motion. A motion. Second. Second. Discussion? <coughs> Item 1, 71 Hill, LLC, uh, rent for the Building Inspector's Office for November 4774. All alert. Alert All Corporation, Fire Prevention Materials by the Fire Department, 2009-7650. Aldo Andrioli, Engineering Fee for October, 3,250. Automated Logic, HVAC maintain, Maintenance Contract for the Fire Department, 1,898. Black Gold Industries, 14 tons of cold patch, 1,683.88. CSEA Employment Benefit Fund, November Premium, 23,391.90. Page 2, Firematic Supply, Fire, fire Truck, 
equipment, 1,339.44. Fundamental business services, collection fees for the court for September 4,150.50. Page five, uh, Morsic and Son, uh, September Fest carding, 3,700. New York State Employee Health Insurance for November, 239,333.34. Page six, reform printing, uh, PD parking tickets, 1278.55, Postmaster of Southampton, ambulance mailing for the bond, vote 1693.28. Page seven, Ronco cleaning supplies, 2142.54, Rosemar constructions, uh, pays, paving on Halsey Neck, uh, 39,236.13. The other piece of this was paid out of the capital reserve, which I'll get to in a minute. Sadie Levine, um, Payment on account for the 531-14 audit, 17166 Southampton Village Ambulance reimbursed a training course. This was funded by Suffolk County. Suffolk County paid us the check. We just just washing it through because it's made payable to the village rather than the ambulance court. Page 8, Sprague, uh, 3,016 gallons of diesel fuel, 8,885.29. Strong's Marine Ferry refurbishment, refurbishment 3,243.17. Student Roth Consulting for the ARB, 1,200. <coughs> Sint Syntax Communications, Ambulance Postcards, 1,095. Uh, Vince Toomey, Legal Fees for September, 2007-2761. Page 9, Town of Brookhaven, Dumping Fees, 3,176.28. United Metro Energy, 3,000 gallons of gasoline, 7,880.10. Verizon, September uh, phone bill, 2,773.29. Capital Reserve Warrant. <coughs> Suit auto emergency, lights for the new police car, 1032.08, and Rosemont construction, the balance of the Halsey Neck paving bill, 220,000. Other discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Resolved that a public hearing be held at 6 p.m. on Thursday, November 13th, 2014, in the boardroom of Village Hall, 23 Main Street, Southampton, New York, to hear citizens' views on local needs with respect to the community development program for the year 2014. Good motion. Make the motion. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Resolved that the Board of Trustees hereby approves the amendment of Article 4, Section 1-7 of the Southampton Fire Department bylaws changing the location of elections from the Windmill Lane Firehouse to the Hampton Road Firehouse. Got a motion? Make the motion. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 And resolved that the Board of Trustees hereby approves the following payments from the Capital Reserve Fund subject to permissive referendum. $220,000 to Rosemark Construction from the Facilities Reserve and <coughs> $1,032.08 from the Major Equipment Reserve to Pursuit Auto Emergency. Can I have a motion? I'll make that motion. Second. 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 All in favor? Aye. 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 No, oh, that's for paving. Oh, paving. Yeah, that's paving. 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 That's okay. All right. All right. We have one discussion item. Yeah. Uh, Rick's not here yet, but um, when we uh, filed the moratorium, and I, you know, John Foster and I had a conversation with him, and with regard to the two ways of handling these uh, exemptions that have come in, we've received two so far. Uh, but essentially, you know, the, the board can either elect to hold the public hearings within the regularly scheduled board meetings, or we can uh, do separate meetings to do, um, go through these. All right. I think we should, uh, for me personally, I think we should just do it at the our board meetings, and uh, it's televised, and it's an opportunity for everybody to, to do that. So, and it remains consistent so that people know when our board meetings are and mm -hmm. stuff instead okay. of special meetings, so that's my own personal. No, I agree. We already have, we already have it working for us, right. so it's still really. Yeah. Okay. okay. I'll work it out with him, and then we'll probably uh, we'll have time to do a 10-day publication yeah. uh, to get them on for the November 13th meeting. Yeah, because we have the two letters that came in already, so one was on the 450 gen line, and the other one is uh, 320, uh, 320 Murray Place. Right. Okay. Um, so we'll, uh, yeah. Very good. Okay. Okay. Oh, this works not here. With, uh, that's the agenda so far here. I'll get the comments from board members. Uh, Trustee Yaz. 
So again, one final reminder for everybody, in addition to having a happy Halloween, is you're going to get out and vote for the SVBA, Silent Village Volunteer Ambulance uh, Bond Vote for their building, which is on October 31st, Friday, on Pond Lane, where we typically have all our village voting from 12 to... 12 to 9. 12 to 9. So it's not going to be the cultural center. It's going to be in the vets hall, which is next door the to the okay. uh, cultural center. So now in the cultural right. center, the vets hall right next door, adjacent, from 12 to 9 on the 31st. So please, if you're a registered voter for Southampton Village, please show up and support the volunteer ambulance of the village. Thank you. Do I got anything else, nope. Mike? Uh, you know, fall is a great time of year, really, in Southampton. Uh, I'd urge everybody to get out because the beaches are absolutely spectacular around here and uh, with the reduced amount of, of people out it's it's great to go out and take a walk and go around your village and even though it's October we got a lot of stuff coming up I guess we got rag muffin parade this weekend right yeah rag and muffin parade yeah and you got uh, Halloween you got the vote so uh, despite the uh, dwindling population here we got a lot of stuff going on and I tell everybody take a walk and get out and see the village it's a good time of year to see all the stuff yep. yeah Nancy uh, I don't really have all that much I think there's also an event at um, the Southampton yep. um, Art Center correct there is on that is that on Friday night it's on uh, Saturday. Saturday oh Saturday, Saturday. Party, yeah. okay or in a haunted house yeah. No, just that everybody stay safe and enjoy the holiday. Bill? I just got one little thing that would um, be a little obtuse about. Uh, one of our citizens uh, has been observed by me countless times doing something that I, at, at probably the first 30 times I saw him doing it, I didn't realize what he was doing. But he lives at the far western corner of the village and he walks down um, Hill Street and I it took me a long long time to realize that he was picking up every cup and candy wrapper and everything else and putting it in a bag and then he walks back the other side and I think he does this almost uh, if yeah, I've seen daily. him daily uh, yeah I was yeah. gonna say I think it's daily and I think we should make recognition I hate to mention his name because if you turn me down it'll be an embarrassment no, I, I, <laughs> but it's if, funny. if you think it's a good idea it's funny you you're, you're talking because I asked him because he was walking with the bag in the pole yeah. I said, what are you doing? And uh, he told me what he was doing. I think it's a, absolutely a fantastic thing, and it, I think you an should... award for the Mr. Clean uh, I to think Mike Charm, former yeah. proprietor of Barrister Re Restaurant, and he has this each and every day, and he, he picks up everything from Bailey Road to uh, Dillage Hall, I think, or darn close to it. But anyhow, it's just mm -hmm. kind of remarkable to see him doing it day after day, and then to see him, if you happen to buy, you'll see him walking back and doing the other side of the road. So... I think we're right. Give him a this track. Uh, <laughs> uh, the tree trimming was done on. Pardon? Tree trimming was done on 39. Tree trimming the trees on the highway again. <laughs> there you go. Today they were, yeah. Uh, I didn't hear you. Um, no. Good to see you. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, could we draw up a, I think a, a commendation for Mike? I think it would be a great idea. I think it would be just it great. Be a great and, idea. Uh, uh, kind of an unbelievable book to see somebody doing this on virtually yeah. a daily That's basis. Great. And sometimes he fills up two or three bags. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Is, yeah. Um, yeah. So th just to, to reiterate, on uh, Friday, October 31st, from 12 to 9, is uh, the vote for the uh, bond for the new uh, fire, uh, fire ambulance barn. They did an open house uh, on the 15th. 15th. It was uh, a lot of people there. Uh, some good questions, good presentation by the chief and the, the uh, uh, contractors. Uh, we got the, the Ragamuffin Parade, which is Sunday, October 26th at 1 o'clock. Starts at Agawam Park. On Saturday, uh, the, the dog walk is uh, to dress your dog up and bring them through the village, uh, starting down on Job's Lane. Uh, we have uh, actually on Saturday the, the 25th also is at the Southampton Arts Center is the Halloween party uh, and they, they have a haunted house that's starting up and they've done a great job with that so yes. I encourage people to go in and support the Southampton Arts Center and uh, a great group of people led by Fairley Polaro and, and her family mm -hmm. they did a nice job. 
uh, Elm Street will be closing Elm Street again uh, for like we've done in the past. I think it's a success and the residents like it. Uh, it'll be a Friday night, so it'll be a, it'll be an interesting uh, time. So, um, but one, one of the things is I'd like for us to start thinking in terms of one of the issues was that Airbnb, which uh, which online um, um, basically single house where somebody's renting out rooms on a daily basis uh, overnight with no license there there's they don't meet any of the fire uh, code requirements uh, there's nothing in our code that says oh they can and they can't do that and we have uh, bed and breakfasts that operate in the village they do it legally they do it department of health standards they meet all the fire codes they have this occupancy we have uh, the Southampton Inn and Latch and a bunch of places that are, and then we have other people that are uh, that are basically um, taking advantage of uh, individuals and not providing what I think is a they're going to rent rooms out on a daily basis. They should meet certain standards. So I think what I'd like for us to start doing is look at through the winter time and putting something into our code. I don't even know where to start on this. Uh, and uh, and think in terms of kind of a minimum rental time frame and um, and how how we would approach this I don't know what you guys if you've even thought about this but I know it's a problem I think in the cold right now that right it's re yeah. renting out on a daily basis right so it would be a violation of the existing code there's nothing in the code right now yeah there's nothing in the code that permits it that permits it but there's nothing in the code that uh, that uh, doesn't permit it either. Oh, is it in a residential district? It's in a it's residential. It's a one-family dwelling? Yeah. It can only be used for one-family dwelling use, which is yeah. Yeah, defined I mean, it's in the code. For, it's already forbidden, I think, because so I think New York City's battling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, okay. if you go online, there, there are about a half a dozen. There, and we had, I think, you know, Angel had looked at that, and we were trying to figure out how to how to do it. Because I know there's one that's on the corner of Woolley and Hampton Road. It's actually in the office district, is what it is. But it's a residentially zoned. It's a, I should say it's a CO is a single family home, and uh, I know it's a problem there. But uh, so uh, it's a yeah, violation of the existing violation code. of the existing code. Okay. So I'll have, Chief, do you have a, come on up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we looked at it, the building department told us that they didn't feel comfortable enforcing on it. So okay. I think we should toughen it up a little bit. Okay. The Attorney General just did a big investigation, so maybe there's some guidance there. Okay. You know, they did, uh, they made the people return the money and everything else. Really? So, you know. Where was just, this? The New York State Attorney General did it in New York City. Yeah, New York, was New York City. Like thirty nine yeah. million dollars were was spent in New York City on this stuff by people. So okay. well I think they were able to battle it because the avoidance of hotel taxes, all the taxes that the hotel industry charges. Right. And that's how they got around enforcing that was because they were basically tax you know, they were uh, evading taxes uh, and, and yeah, renting I mean, out uh, in addition to <coughs> renting multiple times. Yeah, I recall Angel telling me that the the building inspectors didn't feel comfortable. Okay. Enforcing on what we have, so maybe we just have to put one more line in there so or we something. Need, well, we need to oh, make so it explicit. So, we'll, Brenda, instead of meeting up with John and Chris and Rick and Angel and myself and anybody else on the board who'd like to uh, uh, sit in on that, so we could actually. I think East Hampton is too. inundated with this. And I do I think, too. I think we need to talk to East Hampton because I do know a couple of years ago. Well, first of all, the town code was that you weren't allowed to rent your house for anything less than 29 days, which has been changed because when you apply for a rental permit, you weren't supposed to be renting it for less than 29 days. But I said to them, how can you enforce that when the federal government allows you to rent your house for two weeks tax-free? And, you know, how can you say it has to be a minimum of 29 days? So they changed that. However, in East Hampton, they were concerned about it because people were doing it like a bed and breakfast, 
where they would rent to somebody for a week, then the following week someone else would come in. So what they were trying to do was limit the amount of weeks you could have. So in other words, if you wanted to rent your place for a week, you could only do that for two or three or five times. I can't remember what they decided. And that was it. But that's very tough to police. And some of these people there aren't is, even... There is something in our code, I don't have it in front of me, that allows uh, a one-family dwelling to have... I think it's... Well, I'm just going by recollection now. There's something in there that I think allows the uh, a one-family dwelling to have one or, one or two borders or something like that. There's something in there, but... Okay. So, we need to look at that then. But... Uh, yeah, you gotta be careful of who you start enforcing who are doing some legitimate things. It may be things. more of an enforcement matter than, uh, than, than, than changing the code. Okay. Yeah, some of these we people... We also have to look at the parking as I mean, sometimes it may be this. difficult to prove mm -hmm. these things. Right. right. I think always, that's always been a problem for any <laughs> municipalities to prove yeah. that... Yeah. Well, I, th I think the issues have been written, that have been uh, brought up or, or turnover of these people and the sheer volume, the amount of people coming in, you know... But I also think parking has also and been which, which leads to the whole parking issue. Yeah, because, because if you have, amount. if you're renting a room out and it's a couple and they oh. each have a car... <laughs> You know, because they want the freedom of each being able to go wherever they want while they're out here. Now you have a homeowner with a car, you have tenants with cars, and you don't have enough parking area. So now they're on the street. We've already had people bring this up to us. Um, in some cases, they're blocking people's driveways. Um, and, you know, I think if this is going to happen, we have to make sure that whoever is renting out a room uh, needs to provide parking. Right. Well, we had some, you know, we had every variety. We had people who weren't at home and rented their house. They had people that had people in their house while they were there. And then we had <coughs> people like the house on Woolley Street. They rented it to like 15 kids for one night. They got there for the prom. They were there at whatever time, midnight, and left at 4 o'clock the next day. They were out in the yard playing volleyball, and we pulled up on them. We were like, what are you doing? They were like, oh, we rented. we, we got to be gone in an hour. <laughs> so, Well, a lot know, of these houses are, uh, a lot of them are advertised online in the addresses and stuff. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I've <laughs> seen them often. I went, wait a minute. It's pretty, uh, pretty plain. And they're, they're scattered all around the village in the residential area, and they're renting them for the weekend. Some of the people that we Some talked to didn't realize they couldn't do it and stopped. And some people, I don't think are going to yeah, stop. I think just a lot of people don't realize that they're possibly breaking the law, or yeah. certainly code. Yeah, it's worth looking at. Well, I think Good. we need to know what they can do. Yeah, so <coughs> so we'll we'll Chief, we'll, we'll set that meeting up, Brendan, and we'll, uh, and I don't know who else wants to be there. I'd like to be okay. There. And uh, Mike there, and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll start working on this, because I, I think we've got to get in front of it uh, and go into... <laughs> The, the winter time, the late winter, and finish this out, knowing exactly, send a message out to people. Exactly. Well, shouldn't we also find out what the AG, Attorney General, did for the state, how that applies yeah. to us in yeah. addition to anybody else? Like New York? It, that's what, like I said, I remember they got millions back. Yeah, this stuff just came out this past, yeah. like two days ago. I mean, well, probably could turn over these properties to the AG's office and let them go after the same thing. I mean, I'm sure it will be in the paper, <clears throat> but I think... One, I mean, I think a lot of people in the town, and I'm just going back to the town, they don't even realize they're supposed to have a rental permit in the town. And a lot of people, even if they knew they were supposed <coughs> to have a rental permit, wouldn't get it anyway. But um, I always said, why don't you send out a notification in the real estate taxes when they come due that you are required, if you're renting your house, to have a rental permit. We don't require a rental permit in the village, but I think if we have a code that doesn't allow for this, maybe when we send out our taxes, we should have that included. Our codes do not allow for Short whatever, rental, however whatever, we're yeah. going to word that, so yeah. that they're aware yeah. of it, and we've notified mm -hmm. them. Okay. Good point. So, okay, great. Thanks, Chief. Um, so, yeah, that's a, uh, so, it's a good discussion. So we've got a lot of events coming up here, and uh, and so I encourage everybody to uh, participate in them. Uh, so we've got the uh, second public comment uh, section there. Yeah. Yeah.
Sorry if I sounded a bit testy before. Occasionally my sense of humor fails me. But um, uh, for most of the things that uh, I could tell you, you'll probably have to wait for the nonfiction book, which is a little while off. But uh, I started the story of the check, and I think you should hear about that. So once I had filed the affidavit and copies of the check, I called Albany. Didn't know the guy from a bedpost. Turned out to be the village insurer. Turned out his was one of the two signatures. So I said, well, I would like to see the documents that uh, uh, are backup for this check. And he said, well, our claims office is in Uniondale, Long Island. I burst out laughing, which was a mistake, of course. I said, now, why doesn't that surprise me? By the time I called Uniondale, uh, the claims office, it was shut tight. I mean, they'd been warned that I was coming. So I had my accountant call. Well, all hell broke loose. Uh, Mayor Epley's uh, uh, attorney wrote all kinds of nasty emails to me and so forth, demanding the check, which is sort of stupid. It was made out to me. There are only two people who have the right to it, the maker, and I'm not forced to, and I. You know. But anyway, I thought it was an excellent opportunity because I do believe in having light shining on everything. And so I filed for a protective order for my accountant and me, which gave me an excuse to have the check and everything in there. Guess what? A clerk of the EDNY left the check out. I refiled it. You know, I watch the clerks very carefully. Uh, now, these things happen just when I have deadlines on papers I have to submit. Let me tell you another one. I duly filed the appeal in December. On the, tw uh, the uh, uh, Second Circuit Court of Appeals has clerks who manage each case. On the 23rd of January, my clerk had put in an order for having my appeal put on expedited calendar. That would have killed it, of course. So first thing I did was call him and say, hey, what gives? He says, you asked for it and the judge agreed. Yes, of course not. I'd already filed a, nine, a, a form that was required which said there were nine issues I intended to bring up in my brief. So I did a motion to vacate that order. Uh, by the way, that clerk was immediately substituted by two people, a supervisor and a clerk. Uh, so we know that uh, it smelled to high heaven. Uh, what happened next is that uh, um, Judge Ralph Winter, who is also a professor of law at Yale and who was at one time chief ju judge of the Second Circuit, granted my uh, uh, my uh, motion, which meant that I had till the 23rd of April to file my brief, which is a much better way. And of course, I could put in as many issues as I chose, as I t you know, already announced. Well, three weeks later, guess what happened? I was in Switzerland on a little breather, which I needed for skiing and all, and got the email from my uh, caretaker saying, your house is flooded, what shall I do? <laughs> I said, do what you have to, I'll pay. Got up at 4.30 in the morning, was a, took the four-hour trip to bus trip to uh, Zurich, took the plane back, got here the next day, Saturday. By 6.15 6 in my apartment, by 6.30, I had a claims number from a lousy insurance company, but no matter. Next day, I was meeting with uh, the uh, people. I had $150,000 worth of damage. Your sense of humor fails a little at that point. However, I do want you to feel very good about this. I'm highly resilient. I filed my brief a day early, and uh, uh, nothing happened between that time and my reply brief. <laughs> Some, somehow I was left alone. Anyhow, I'm sorry if I was testy, but I think you can understand that occasionally we have a little hard time. That's another reason I didn't have anyone else sign the petition. I don't think my neighbors need flooded basements or the other garbage I've gone through. Thank you. Good night. Anyone else from the public would like to speak? Okay, so I'm going to make a motion to uh, close the public hearing and adjourn to uh, executive session for the purpose of discussing employee matters. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye.